You're giving her mouth to mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and you, if you bring her back to life, that would be the funniest thing I've ever seen. Mouth to mouth on the queen. Now it's time to put everything you've learned together and suit up and go out and inspect your hive and see what you find. First, double check your list to make sure you have everything you need. Two of the, this is things that you need to bring to the bee yard. Uh, the two most important things are a smoker and a hive tool. Uh, you need to have those no matter what. Smoke calms the bees. Uh, the hive tool you use that to pry the boxes apart and to get the frames on. Uh, without the hive tool, you're never going to get it. Uh, you need a smoker fuel. You can use burlap, uh, pine needles, pine combs, cardboard, almost anything that burns, anything that's not synthetic. Uh, other things, you can bring water. You could need to stay hydrated. Uh, an EpiPen's not a bad thing to have because you never know if somebody's going to need it. Uh, flashlight to look for young bees, larva. Uh, bee suit. Bee suit's a good thing to use. I don't always put the veil up because of my eyes, but I will if I have to. Uh, gloves. I rarely use gloves, but I do have them with me if I get a real bad hive. I carry everything in this. You can use a five gallon bucket or you can buy something from a bee supply that's specifically uh, made for that. Uh, that's about it for what you really need to have here. And then uh, you'll find other things. I have a capping scratcher, scissors. I have a, a lighter just in case I wouldn't. My torch wouldn't work. You still got to have a way to light it. So that takes care of about everything that you need. In terms of the timing of the inspection, you'll plan on checking the hives in the spring and summer once a week or once every couple of weeks, and in the winter about once a month. In terms of the best time of day, the whole idea is you want to open up the hive when the fewest number of bees are inside, so when all the foragers are out. So between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. is normally the best time of day to open up the hive. Also, if it's raining or really windy or really, really cold, don't open up your hive. You don't want to subject your bees to all of the elements. Well, you want to do it on a bright sunlit day. If you do it on a rainy overcast day when the bees can't fly, they're already in a bad mood. And when you open a hive, they're going to blame it on you. Uh, bees are always looking for something to blame somebody for. One of the simplest things you can do to inspect the hive of bees is just by taking the cover off of it and seeing what's going on in there. If you take the cover off and the bees come roaring out of there and try to eat you alive, something's wrong. They're either hungry or irritated by something. Uh, from anywhere from a mouse to, you know, parasites that bees can get. Uh, but if you open a hive up and they just go bzzz and they sit there and they don't come flying out, everything is pretty good. I feel like I need to mention this again. You need to protect your eyes when you suit up. I say suit up the whole way, try not to get stung. But for those of you who are really impatient and you don't feel like suiting up all the way, the main thing you want to do is protect your eyes. Also, don't wear any cologne or fragrance perfume of any kind because that will annoy the bees or maybe attract the bees to you and you don't want that. So wash your bee suit in fragrance-free detergent. In fact, wash everything that you're wearing in fragrance-free detergent and be aware of your shampoo, your deodorant, any powder you might put on. Don't have a lot of fragrance when you open up the hive. When you open up the hive and the bees are annoyed, it will smell like ripe bananas. They make that smell. So if you smell that, you know you've annoyed them. Also, some beekeepers say that if you eat bananas right before you open up the hive, that it will make them think it's an alarm pheromone. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. I can just tell you that I don't eat bananas before I open up a hive just in case.
The first thing you do when you get to your hive is light the smoker. Of course, that's very important. And I love the cedar chips. They smell good. They stay lit a long time. You can use hamster bedding, which is also really cheap and works really well. I like a tiny strip of burlap in there too. It seems to light faster and stay lit longer. You'll light it, puff the bellows a little bit, get it going well. And once it's going, put another handful of the smoker fuel on top of that just to keep it lit. So when it's time to open up the hive, stand behind the hive. You don't want to stand in front of the hive. That's their front door where they're going in and out. And when they realize something's going on, they're going to go out that front door and you will be a target. So stand in the back or maybe to the side just to protect yourself and not to annoy the bees too much. First, reach around and puff some smoke in the entrance of the hive, just to kind of keep them busy. Take your hive tool and open up the outer cover next. And again, there's a really good chance that it's glued shut with propolis because the bees want to keep everything really sanitary. So your hive tool will come in really handy. Take the top off and put it upside down on the ground. You're going to need this to put some of your hive boxes on top of so you don't have to set them directly on the ground. Puff some smoke in the hole of the inner cover. Again, this will just calm them down and mask the alarm pheromone. And then take your hive tool and pry open the top of that outer cover and set that down. You'll also want a few extra puffs on all the frames once you take that inner cover off. Now you'll want to pull out the frames, frame by frame, and what you want to do is start on either end. You don't want to start in the middle because the queen is probably there in the middle laying eggs. You don't want to pull a frame up and accidentally squash her or damage her in any way. You have to protect the queen. So start on the far end. Take your hive tool, pry it up, slowly pull it out so you don't damage any bees, and check out to see what's going on. Don't be surprised if there's really nothing going on on one of the end frames. Don't set this down flat on the ground because it'll get dirt on it or grass on it. Kind of prop it up against the hive. Now just go frame by frame, pulling them up slowly, one at a time. And remember, the number one thing you're looking for is eggs. If you see eggs, you know that the queen is doing a great job and she's alive, which is the most important thing. You know, if you find uh, freshly laid eggs, that's just as good as finding a queen. You probably will want to use your flashlight to look for eggs because depending on how the sun is and how dark the comb is, they can be really hard to find. So pull out your flashlight and look and you'll save yourself a lot of time. Get yourself a pair of these readers. Unfortunately, I'm not as good as I used to be and I need a pair of these to see eggs now. So and then working in a bee suit with a pair of readers is not the funnest thing in the world, but it's necessity. The egg tells you the queen's been there on that frame within the last three days. So you know she's not far away. Start paying attention now to how much brood you're finding. You do want a lot of worker bee brood and just a little bit of drone brood, but not too much. If you can tell strength of a colony by how many bees are on top of an inner cover, you take an outer cover off. If bees are clear to the edges of that inner cover, that's a pretty good strong hive. If they're just around the hole, that's not as strong. Take a look now at a pattern of baby bees. Here in the middle and then around the top outside, you'll see how they've sealed up some honey. It's important to spot the difference between what is sealed honey and what is sealed brood. The wax looks a little bit different. The capped over brood looks a little more papery and flat. The wax over the honey is sort of fluffy. And you can also see the colorful pollen in some of the cells. They normally keep the pollen right around the brood because they want it handy as they make that bee bread for the developing babies. It's how they're setting up their kitchen. They'll build the brood chamber in sort of a half moon. And above that, they'll put a band of pollen and a band of uh, honey. That way they have food right close to the brood chamber. And if you open a hive up, and you're wondering if you have a queen or not because you can't find anything. If they're bringing pollen in and they're storing it, but they're keeping the center of that hive open and it looks clean, they expect the queen to start laying eggs in it pretty soon. 
the more solid the brood pattern, probably the better indication that your queen is doing very well and that you have less parasitized bees, uh, less mite problems. But if you see brood with, you know, a lot of holes in it, you know, a brood pattern that's spotty, you know, something could be wrong. It could be just a lack of feed, but it could be a failing queen. There's a lot of different variables there. When you do find the eggs, make sure that there's only one per cell. If you find more than one egg per cell, remember, you might have an overeager worker bee trying to lay unfertilized eggs, which is going to do you no good. If you don't see any eggs, what do you do? Well, there's two causes for that. Either you don't have a queen or you have a virgin queen and you need to come back in a few days to see if she's mated and started laying eggs yet. Okay, so you've checked for eggs, you've checked the brood pattern, you've checked to see how much honey that they have to eat, and maybe you were even lucky enough to find the queen. Again, that's really not necessary if you found the eggs because you know that she's been there. And remember this, when you're opening up the hive and looking frame by frame, she knows something's going on and she's running away from you. So don't get too discouraged if you didn't find her. It's fun to find her though. What I like to do is, uh conquer and divide. If you have a three-story colony and the queen is in there somewhere, you want to take that hive and immediately tear it in three pieces. Uh, and then you look for the queen in the bottom box first because returning bees are coming back to that bottom box. And soon it'll get bigger population than it's easy to find the queen in. Uh, so you look in the bottom box first, uh, whether it's a, a one-story or a three-story colony. Uh, is where you look first. And if you don't find her there, go to the next box and to the next box. If you try to take a hive apart from the top down and look through the top box and then look through the next box, sometimes the queen will just run from the top box to the next box and then you'll find her in the bottom box eventually as she gets clear to the bottom. Or sometimes things can get so disrupted you'll never find a queen. While you're checking your hive, you'll want to check for queen cells, those long peanut-shaped cells where queens are growing. The workers will make anywhere from 2 to 20 of these, and it could mean that they're planning to swarm or that they just need a new queen because the current queen is failing for some reason. Here's a way to tell the difference with that. Swarm cells are at the bottom edge of the comb. And if the current queen is failing, they'll make some queen cells right in the middle on the face of the frame, and that's when they need a new queen. So what do you do? If you see a supersedure cell, the bees probably know best. Their queen is failing for whatever reason, and you just want to let nature take its course. But if you see some swarm cells, there are some things that you can do, because that means in the not too distant future, that hive is going to prepare to swarm. Uh, you have to make decisions. Now, if, if I see a queen cell or a start of a queen cell, I'll look for the queen. I'll look for eggs and I'll look for a queen. If I can find eggs, it means the queen's, she was there within the last three days. If I can find a queen, I'll take her out and I'll start a nuke with her. Give her maybe two frames of cat brood and put her in a nuke box. That means instead of swarming, they're going to have to, and it's best if you destroy all but maybe the, the biggest three cells so that you don't get queen to death. You know, everybody hatches out at once and you don't know what's going to happen. But if you uh, destroy all but three of them, the best ones, biggest ones, then when they hatch out, their first one out will probably kill the other two, and she'll take over that hive. Voila, congratulations. You've just created a man-made swarm and created your own nuke, and you have another hive. Will that prevent your current hive from swarming? Not necessarily, but you've done what you can, and you've at least slowed it down, and you've helped them swarm all on your own by creating a second hive. If your hive doesn't have a queen, you also have some decisions to make. If you can't find any eggs, 
Either that means there's no queen at all, or you have a virgin queen who's out getting mated and maybe she just hasn't started laying yet. So you want to come back in a few days just to make sure that you didn't have a virgin queen. If you still don't see eggs, you'll have to introduce a new queen just like we showed you before. If you have another hive though, there's something else you can do. You can have them make their own queen by taking some of the frames that have eggs and really young larvae and putting that into your queenless hive and giving the bees the opportunity to make a new queen all on their own. Remember, they can't make a queen though with older larvae. So you have to find a frame that has eggs and super young larvae because they have to feed the queens that diet of royal jelly. You'll want to see when it's time to put on a super, which is so exciting. Remember, the super is the smaller box for your honey that you'll extract and bottle and enjoy. The rule in the spring is when dandelions start to bloom or fruit is blooming in your area, it's time to put on a super. You need to ask local beekeepers what they do because every place is different, but getting supers on is important, not only for you to get honey, but also to give the bees enough room because this is the time when the hive starts to rapidly expand. For this, you'll want to use your queen excluder. Just set it right on top of that upper brood box and then put your super right on top of it. The queen can't slide through the excluder, but the worker bees can. So these top boxes will be filled with honey instead of eggs and brood. Also, you don't want to add supers too soon because your hive will be susceptible to wax moths. It's just too much space for the bees to tend to. So wait until it's time. You add a super whenever they have uh, three quarters of the frames filled out in the box that you have. If it's, if it's an eight frame box when they have about six filled out, when you're done inspecting, put all the frames back in order if possible. If you can't though, that's okay. Close up the hive. Use your hive tool to keep the frames tight together in the brood boxes. Remember that bee space rule. You don't wanna to leave too much space or too little space for them to fill with comb or propolis. When you close up the hive, you might want to prop open the cover just a little bit to allow for more airflow because ventilation is so important. Moisture is really bad for your hive. We use, I use paint sticks, uh, sometimes shims from uh, the hardware store like you use for doors. And what I do in the winter time, the bees need ventilation. So I break a piece of this off and uh, I usually use pliers or something to break it and just stick it under the inner cover to uh, give the bees a little more ventilation. It's like whenever you went to a drive-in and you're breathing, you can't, you had to roll the windows down to get the windows clear so you could watch the movie. Uh, so the bees need ventilation. There's more bees that have been killed by non-ventilation and got, getting wet from the moisture going up, hitting the lid and coming raining down on them than there ever was with cold. Bees can handle the cold. If there's enough bees in there and it's healthy hive, they can handle really low temperatures, but they can't get wet and do it. They'll, they'll die of hypothermia. The same with if you get if you you have nice warm clothes on you're fine. If you get drenched with water and it's cold, that's not good. You'll also want to put something on top of your hive to keep the top from blowing off. So a brick works great. You can ratchet strap down, which we do for most of our hives. That protects it not only from wind but from even bears. We've been hit by bears a few times. We even had to put up a solar powered bear fence in a few of our yards. An entrance reducer is something important to think about depending on the time of year because a smaller entrance allows the guard bees to guard the hive a lot easier. 
but if your hive is big and expanding quickly, you don't want that entrance reducer on there because you need a lot of room for bees to come and go. So you don't want the entrance reducer on there all the time. And it does limit the ventilation and the airflow. So a lot of beekeepers don't like to use them because they know moisture is really bad for the hive, but an entrance reducer can be important to guard against critters trying to get in, including other honeybees trying to rob. Some people leave them in all year round. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, some people take them off. Now you need to put an entrance reducer for the winter as a moss guard. Because if the bees are up here, they get in a second super, a moss will go in there and build a nest down below. Now if he's still there, whenever the bees get active, they'll kill him. But in the meantime, he's going to urinate all over your hive, chew holes in the comb, and generally make a mess of things. Boy, that's, that's some of the black art in beekeeping. Uh, if you have a windy location, you maybe need to use an entrance reducer. Or if you're trying to protect a weaker hive from being robbed out by stronger hives, that's the time to use entrance reducers. Most of the time, you want to keep an entrance as big as you can to let the bees ventilate as much as they can. Uh, so, you know, in the wintertime, you, you want to reduce the, the height of the entrance so mice can't get in. You know, if you reduce it down to three-eighths of an inch, mice typically can't get through that space. Some use, like, uh, hardware cloth of, you know, that bees can pass through to keep mice out. Uh, Check their honey stores to make sure that they have enough to eat. If there's a dearth in your area and nothing's blooming, you'll want to feed them for that. In the spring and summer, you feed them sugar syrup. And in the winter, you give them something solid like a sugar patty or a block of fondant to eat. In the winter, you don't want to give them a lot of liquid because they have to go out and take a cleansing flight. And in the winter, it takes them a while because it has to be warm enough for them to go out. Bees have to eliminate. Uh, and it's like you, if you were, if you were at the mountains and the odd house was a hundred yards away and it was zero degrees, you would not drink a lot of coffee. Uh, it's the same thing with bees. In the first place, you got to have a way to warm that sugar water or it'll get hyperthermia just drinking it. Uh, but they have to eliminate the moisture. So you want to give them everything that has low moisture either sugar bricks or fondant. Hives need 60 to 80 pounds of honey to make it all the way through the winter. And that amounts to about 15 frames of honey. So you'll wanna make sure that you leave them that much to last through the winter, even if that means no honey for you. Let's talk about feeding now. This is how I feed spring syrup. This is done when nothing is blooming, so in the early spring and in the summer dearth. The recipe is one-to-one -one sugar and water. I do the one-to-one -one and then pour it into a Ziploc baggie and lay it down on top of the frames and use a knife to slice a line right through part of the top so they can get to it. There are also feeders you can buy and you can put a feeder in place of one of the frames. That's all up to you. If you use the baggy method, then you'll need to put a shim on top of the hive body to give the syrup room enough before you add the inner cover on top of it. You wanna come back and check on this often though, because once they get done eating all that sugar syrup, there's gonna be a lot of room. And what are they gonna do with that room? They're gonna make a lot of burr comb in there and it's gonna be messy for everybody. So once they get done eating that baggie of sugar syrup, you'll either wanna add some more sugar syrup or you'll wanna take that shim off and put the inner cover down flat on top of the hive. There are also front entrance feeders and hive top feeders and a lot of fun things to experiment with. When the nectar flow starts again though, and things are blooming, they're gonna ignore anything that you put in there for them and they're gonna go out and they're gonna get the good stuff. And if there's a nectar flow on, the bees won't even come around. You know, nobody wants, nobody wants canned tomatoes whenever you got fresh ones in the garden. Finally, let's talk about winter feeding, which is really important because the colder it is outside, the more they have to eat to have the energy needed to stay warm. Uh, honeybees 
have the ability to disconnect their flight muscles from their wings. In other words, they can vibrate that flight muscle and not flap their wings, and they use that to be able to generate heat in the wintertime. They'll eat honey, and the cluster slowly moves. If you were to take a time lapse photography of a cluster, the bees on the outside move to the inside, and the bees on the inside move to the outside, and it has the ability to move that whole cluster around in the hive as, it, as they need to move to food. So even in real cold weather, they're still alive. Their, their temperature is not what they eat normally keep if they're rear and brood it's less and uh, it, it's one of the magic things in beekeeping. You'll want to check on your hive in the winter about once a month depending on what's going on and you want to feed them something solid. Well I feed anytime I see bees on top of the frames I'll feed them uh, because they're not going to tend to go back down again. Uh, so I, I actually use bakery fondant and I buy it in 50 pound blocks and I put it on about four pounds at a time. I put it in a gallon baggie, uh, cut a hole in the bottom because it's semi-solid and lay that right on there and the bees will go up and clean it right out to the edge. Now some people make sugar bricks, which is completely acceptable also. They'll make it in a pie pan size and put that on there. Other people take their inner covers and they actually fill that up with uh, sugar, heated, you know, with a little bit of water and they pack that in there. And the bees moisture as it comes up, it softens it and then the bees can access it. Now is a really important time to get connected with your local bee club. So if you have any concerns or questions, you have someone to ask, and they can also tell you what's happening in your own community. Now it's time to buzz on over to Module 7.